Welcome to Parliament for Researchers, how to write for a parliamentary audience. My name is Naomi. I am part of the Knowledge Exchange Unit here at the UK Parliament. Uh, we support and strengthen the exchange of information and expertise between Parliament and the research community. And we do that in lots of different ways. So we provide training for researchers about how to work with Parliament. As you know, we have lots of online resources to support you to know how to work with Parliament. We promote any opportunities we can find for researchers to work with Parliament. We run an academic fellowship scheme. And really importantly, we are a point of contact for anyone from the research community who would like to engage with Parliament or connect with someone at Parliament. So I'm joined um, on the session this morning by my colleague Laura Webb from the Knowledge Exchange Unit and our colleague from the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, Christiana Vagnoni, who will be talking you through how to write for a parliamentary audience in a little bit. This is what we are going to be covering today. We're going to just have a very quick uh, reminder of the difference between Parliament and government. And then I'm going to pass you over to Christiana to talk us through what is a parliamentary audience and what makes a good briefing. And then we'll stop and uh, answer some questions. And then I'm just going to give you a few tips about how you target that briefing you've written at Parliament. Where should you target it to have the most impact and what resources and support we've got available for you as well. I just wanted to reiterate uh, that Parliament and government are not the same thing. As you'll know from your prior knowledge, Parliament is made up of all MPs, all members of the House of Lords and the monarch as well. And government down the road in Whitehall rather than in Westminster is just some MPs, some members of the House of Lords who've been chosen by the Prime Minister to be ministers. Uh, they run government departments, they run public services, they introduce a lot of the new laws which come into force, uh, they decide on the policy and the spending in government departments and that government are accountable back to Parliament who conduct scrutiny of the government's work and who must approve laws before they can be passed as well as approving budget and spending proposals. So you'll have remembered that I'm sure I just wanted to reiterate it because it's really useful to know if you're going to write a briefing and then send it in to someone at Parliament or someone at government. You know, you could use it for either, but it's in, it's useful to know who you're talking to. Is it about the development of a policy? Is it a government department working up a policy or a new law? Or is it Parliament challenging and scrutinising something the government is doing? So I'm sure you can kind of see that you might use your briefing that you've written in a different way, depending if you're working with Parliament or government. So now I've refreshed your knowledge about that, I'm really pleased to introduce you to Christiana Vagnoni, uh, who is an advisor in the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. Christiana is an absolute expert in uh, writing for a parliamentary audience and she's going to share some of her expertise with us today. So Christiana, it's over to you. Here I am. <laughs> Thanks Naomi and welcome everybody. So let's start with the parliamentary audience. I think as many of you know already, the first rule of good writing and good communication is to know who you're writing for. And parliamentarians and policymakers are very busy people. And that is the main thing you need to remember. Members do not necessarily have the scientific or technical background on a specific topic, although they're really good at picking up information quickly because it's their main job. And uh, another thing to, important to remember is that research is only one type of information that gets considered when uh, making policy decisions. For instance, think about, I don't know, the impact uh, on people uh, that a decision could make rather than only the science about it. And another important point when you write for a parliamentary audience is the fact that MPs are elected to represent a particular constituency. So when you write about a subject, you can think about whether there is any local area or regional area that could be somehow affected by your science topic so that you can think about, you know, how do we make that, re that topic relevant for that area so an MP represented for that area would care about it. Uh, here we are, what makes a good briefing? So first of all, I have a little disclaimer. Everything here comes from my experience at Post uh, where we write 
specific briefings that are called post-not, post-brief, and also more recently, um, uh, rapid responses on COVID. So whatever I'm telling you today is going to be 100% sure, uh, true for post. And then there are like slightly variations on the topics, more variations on the topic that I'm going to uh, go over with you. So you will have a clear idea of what is what we write at post and what is what you can write for uh, NMPs or peers. So there are four key elements that make a good policy briefing. First, the content. Is the briefing a good summary of evidence? Does it cover what is expected you to? Second, the structure. Do the sections make sense in the order they are? Are represented in the right order? Is it well structured? Uh, third, really important, accessibility. Is the briefing easy to read? Is it concise? Remember, parliamentarians do not have time. They are very busy busy people. So what you need to write is something that could be read quickly over a cup of coffee. That is the ideal briefing. And finally, fourth, impartiality. Is the briefing politically and scientifically impartial? Are all the statements balanced and objective? And this is really important for us at Post, so also for people that are writing a briefing uh, in the staff of the, the libraries or in committee meetings. Uh, however, for you as an academic, is it OK if you move forward your own opinions as an expert on the topic? Because when you're writing a parliamentary briefing, you will write most likely something you're an expert about. In terms of content, here we are. Uh, again, we can borrow some rules from good writing and good communication. And if I'm sure many of you already heard this one is the five W's one H rule. So if a briefing is well written, it should cover what is the key issue? Why is it of interest? Who are the main stakeholders? When are the major impact going to happen? Where is this happening and how the stakeholders will be affected? So remember, over a cup of coffee, your MP and peers should be able to quickly answer to all of these questions. And this is something you need to take in, to keep in mind. Another um, thing to keep in mind is that these uh, five W's, one H rules also apply to single studies you're going to present, right? So when you are writing about the general, uh, you know, research on your field before talking about something more specific, you can say for each studies where the study take place, when did it take place, who took part in the study, how the measurement were taken and what were the results and also why you know the study was done to demonstrate X, Y, Z, for instance. So here again, we have an example. Uh, as you can see here, I'm going to read it for you if you cannot see. A 2019 survey of 2000 women aged 25 to 40 in the UK found that 60% use social media at least once a day. And as you can see here, we have when 2019 survey how the, the data was collected who 2000 women aged 25 to 40 and where in the UK what was it found 60 percent use social media and it's really important to be clear about the evidence you're using because of course a survey of 20 women rather than 2000 women could give you a really different kind of information same if the survey was in 20 I don't know, 2010 versus uh, uh, 2019, 2019, sorry. Um, so next, let's talk about structure. That is very, very important. And um, unfortunately, there is not really a protocol or the perfect formula if you want for a good structure and depends a lot on the topic you're working on. However, this structure presented here, the past, present, future, works for, let's say, 90% of the topics. So past. Background and context, what is the issue? How did it get here? Present, what is the current situation? And future, what are the challenges and opportunities? What is coming next? So these are pretty good structure. that works, as I said, 90% of the times. There are, of course, some variation. Another really important part on uh, uh, structure is to make sure your document is really easy to read and have headings and subheadings and break down blocks of text into small uh, sections. Um, and that is really, really useful for parliamentarians. Another important point is to have an overview at the beginning of the briefing. So that essentially just reading the overviews, they should have an idea of what it's about and hopefully be like, you know, be drawn their attention towards a specific section, for instance, instead of reading it all. And another really important part is uh, 
using figures, charts or diagrams to make your briefing more eye catching, but also give more information. And as you know, uh, given that you're academics, <laughs> like a good figure can be more than a thousand words, right? So use the same principle of like, think about making a good figures. In terms of summaries, I wanted to give you two different examples from two different products uh, at post uh, of how to write summaries. So on the left, you have a post note that is a briefing that is only four pages long. And then on the right, instead you have a rapid response that is a new type of format that we have that is HTML only. So we use different formats and they're slightly different, but the main principle of both these briefings are the same and the, the main principle of the summary is the same. If you read the summary, you shouldn't be, I mean, you shouldn't need to read the rest because remember, parliamentarians are really busy. They want to quick read something and figure out, okay, this is all of this is about. So let's start with um, the post note. These are the two overviews. Uh, if we zoom in the overview of a post note, you can see this is about food fraud. So it can tell you what is food fraud, why is important, who is responsible for it, how can we change things and what's likely or unlikely to happen next? So only in five bullet points, they are able to, to answer the past, present, future structure that we talked about before. Uh, similarly, for these COVID rapid responses, this is an update I wrote in November, so it's not anymore up to date, unfortunately, <laughs> with COVID, uh, but the principle is exactly the same. The structure of the summary is slightly different because it's a different subject that is rapidly evolving. However, again, five bullet points here that are able to highlight where is research at in terms of COVID vaccine? Uh, why, uh, like, you know, what is important for the UK and what is important around the world? So essentially just looking at these parliamentarians now, should I read this briefing? Yes, no, and go farther and start scanning the, the text afterwards. Again, in terms of structure, there is a really good tip that we use at post uh, and also in the libraries pretty often, that is the use of boxes. So boxes are for those things that quite don't fit always in the text, but they should be there. Uh, for instance, if you have a lot of definitions that are kind of like nicely tidy up all together in a corner, or if you have, for instance, legislations that are relevant, or if you have some case studies, remember, you need to make uh, your topic relevant for at a regional level or local level, a nice case study about why an MP MP should care about fishing because there are fisheries around it, his constituency, for instance. And sometimes we also use them for more technical and complex uh, concepts. The idea behind a box is essentially that you should be able to read the brief without having the box. So the box add that extra information that is not 100% necessary to have your briefing flow. But still quite useful. Uh, the third pillar about how to write a good briefing, as I said, is accessibility. And that is probably the hardest one, especially if you guys are used to write for academics and write papers that are pretty dense and definitely not accessible sometimes because they are written for a specialist audience, right? And you can take like a thousand steps back <laughs> from that way of writing and essentially I think that when you write for a parliamentary audience, anyone with your briefing should be able to read it over a cup of coffee and then be able to tell you the five W's, one H, right, after reading it. And it's really, really tough. It's probably the hardest part of writing a briefing. But luckily for you, we have some tips. So as post, we follow these seven tips that are the main ones. So first of all, if you have to say something, and of course you have to say something, say it with fewer words, with less complex language, use objective, precise language, use the active voice rather than the passive voice when, of course, it's possible, and try to be consistent with language, punctuation and definition. If you give one definition, stick with it throughout the piece, because if you add synonyms of the same concept, it just makes it confusing because remember, they are not experts, at least not all MPs are experts. Some of them have a science background, but you need to be read by everyone, right? And then jargon and acronyms. We know that science is full of jargon and acronyms. I would say select only the key ones, the ones that really you need to explain the concept 
and just explain them really clearly at the beginning and then keep using them and don't add anyone else, but just you know the few key ones. And uh, finally, again, think about your audience, can use figures and facts that parliamentary can use of, make use of. Um, so we have like some example of how to say something in a fewer words. As you can see, these are really, really long sentence about the speed of development of new DNA sequencing and analytical technologies, bringing down the press tag of genome sequencing at our teaching space. As you can see, impossible to read. How do we make it fast, uh, quicker and easier to understand? Pretty simple. If my presentation works, here it is. <laughs> DNA sequencing is getting faster and cheaper. Another tip to think about your audience, right? These are parliamentarians. If you, you cannot say the bacterium is microscopic 10 microns wide because they don't have any, you know, 99% of them, maybe like 90% of them that don't have a science background, don't know what a micron is. So you can say in a different way, such as uh, <laughs> that each bacterium is roughly a fifth of the thickness of a sheet of paper. So it cannot be seen by the human eye. And this is really easy to understand for a parliamentarian. Finally, uh, the last pillar for post is impartiality. And it's partial, impartiality is really important for us at post, but also for people writing in the Commons libraries and the Lord's libraries. So we cannot take any, we, can, we are not uh, politically or scientifically uh, partial. We need to present all the different range of perspectives and we cannot give any opinions about something. And this is really important for us, but it's not necessarily again true for you guys because you are writing from an expert perspective. So it's fine that you have your own opinion. <laughs> um, but another important thing that you need to do is attribute a reference. So everything you say, you need to add a reference for it so that they can expand. And if they want to know more information, they have it and it's there. Uh, just a little tip, make sure to use references that are open access so that MPs can actually read it. And finally, that is super, super important, is be clear about uncertainty. I mean, we all know as scientists that science cannot give you always the simple one line answer. Unfortunately, right? That would be amazing. And you have to explain what's the context about it, why we are uncertain about something. Is it because of research? Is it because of the measurements or how it's done? Or is it because there is not enough research? So again, to make it slightly clearer, added here a couple of example about how we can present uncertainty. So for instance, if you know there is not a single number, but there is a range uh, of a certain measurement, you need to use that range and explain why instead of a single number, we have a range for a measurement. For instance, sea level could write 0 0.26, 0 0.77 meters, blah, 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 because modeling cloud cover is a major sort of uncertainty. So you need to be clear and open about what we know and what is the, the, the source of uncertainty and what are the limitations. If there is, you know, not enough evidence about something, just say it and there is say there is insufficient evidence to show X, Y, Z. Similarly, if there is some disagreement or limitation of the research, again, be honest about it and say the majority of the studies shows X, while other research indicates Y. And maybe, you know, the limitations are a big part, like the majority of the studies from the 70s in which they use these super old techniques shows X, but actually now we have better research and it seems that there is a new, you know, new avenue for this research and we know more stuff than before we didn't know. And uh, final tip for you, <laughs> not to forget is to make sure your briefing is dated and to provide the contact details so that people that want to get in touch with you can do it quickly and easily. And uh, this is all from me. I am just looking forward to the questions. So Christiana, uh, some questions for you now. The first one is, uh, what is the most challenging aspect of creating a post note? I think the most challenging part is the four page limit so a post note is only four pages and to be honest i think four pages is the perfect length for a briefing because remember it needs to be read over a cup of coffee so four pages is what you can actually do in a coffee break however it's really hard to figure out what is extra and what needs to be there so the way the way i do it is essentially start working on a four page document already while I write up and then when I see that it's becoming easily seven pages, <laughs> step back 
read again and start taking away part and say, okay, this is nice to know, but is it actually relevant for MP and peers? Uh, do they, would they make a difference if they know this extra detail? And it's important to kind of like think about the bigger picture all the time. Brilliant. Uh, another question we've had in here is uh, if there is any uh, any tips you can give about how to practically balance writing concisely whilst also being precise, which I think is uh, is a challenging thing to do. Do you have any thoughts on how you approach doing that when you're writing for a parliamentary audience? Again, really, really good question. Um, I think that the key, you know, five W one H rule always apply when you write about a single study and yeah. about everything, right? So if you know that you can write the same thing and say, you know, what, when, how, why, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you know, that is exactly the information you need, not more than that. And then, uh, you know, like sometimes we get lost in details. I feel that if you come from a science background, you get lost into the nitty gritty details and like, oh, who say that? What? No, the other person is that. You need to say no, <laughs> step away from it and kind of like try to make like, you know, make sense of the noise around it and say, OK, what are the key points here and how can I answer to the five W one H question? And uh, we'll do one more question just for now. So do you have any tips on how you can conclude a good research briefing? So should you summarize your main points or is there another approach that it's that it's good to take? What would you recommend? That's again a really, really good question. The way in which we conclude our briefings is always about challenging, no, not always, but like 99% of the time, challenges and opportunities for the future, because essentially when you write a briefing, you figure out that there are like a series of open questions, right? And it's something that MP and peers can think about, like when at the end of it, like kind of like the take home message is like, this is what all we know about now, what is the situation? This is what we can do next for the future. And that is definitely a good way to end. Uh, but definitely once you write, I think the last things to do when you write all of these, like all of your briefing is again, take a step back and write your summary as well. So that, you know, <laughs> that is probably your, the conclusion of your work is writing a good summary. Christiana, thank you so much for taking us through such an in-depth look into how you translate research evidence into something which is useful for MPs and members of the House of Lords. I thought it would be really useful to spend five minutes talking you through what you do with this briefing. So you've spent a fantastic amount of time doing your five W's, one H, doing your summaries, uh, making sure you've put your date and contact details on there and you've got a fantastic briefing. What are you going to do with it? How do you target it at Parliament to make sure it's the most effective? So in order to start taking you through that, I'll just give you a tiny overview of the different parts of Parliament who use research, the teams at Parliament using research. We've got House of Commons and House of Lords select committees who use research. We actually have an entire different training session, which is 45 minutes, all about how to work with select committees as a researcher. So I'm not going to tell you too much about select committees today. Uh, parts of the legislative process used for research. Again, I'm not going to focus on that today. I want to talk to you about the House of Commons and House of Lords libraries and post the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. That is where Christiana is based and they post are huge users and uh, producers of research briefings. We've also got a more informal or more political side of Parliament that uses research, of course, MPs and members of the House of Lords and their researchers, confusingly called researchers. Uh, these are members of staff who work for those MPs and Lords, helping them to carry out their parliamentary duties. And APPGs, all party parliamentary groups. The, the bits that I want to pick out and talk to you about uh, this morning are those libraries, post and the APPGs, because I think those are the places that you might want to target a research briefing. So to start with the research and information teams in the in Parliament, we've got POST where Christiana's based. You know loads about how POST notes are produced now. POST are probably the closest bridge between research and policy. 
one of the biggest aims of post is to make sure that research evidence is coming into parliament it's being used by committees it's being used in the legislative process it's being used by mps and peers one of the main ways that post does this is to produce post notes so kind of horizon scanning briefings also post briefs, which are more reactive advice and rapid response uh, briefings, which are um, extremely quickly turned around summaries of research evidence. The Commons and the Lords libraries are a little bit more reactive than horizon scanning. So if post is looking ahead to the next big issues coming across the parliamentary agenda and producing research briefings on those issues, the libraries are looking at what is happening in Parliament right now. What's happening in the House of Commons Chamber? What's happening in the House of Lords Chamber? What is happening in select committees? What pieces of legislation are going through Parliament right now? And they are producing briefings on these uh, pieces of business and they are also answering questions which are being put to them by MPs and Lords. So an MP can get in touch with the House of Commons Library and ask for a briefing on a particular topic which the library will produce and the briefings produced by post in the libraries are always impartial and they are always written specifically for a parliamentary audience the libraries and post are always looking for research and evidence and findings and information to base what they are telling parliamentarians on so they are big consumers of research and the more accessible and concise and targeted you can produce present your research to these teams the more likely it is that they will be using it when writing research briefings for members. And uh, the other side of what I wanted to talk to you about was the all party parliamentary groups. So you remember this is the kind of more political side of research use at Parliament. APPGs are informal groups of MPs and members of the House of Lords. There's one for nearly every country in the world. There are many different subject groups from asthma to veterans. The point of these groups is for members to develop their knowledge about a particular subject, meet other MPs and Lords who are interested, raise awareness about a subject. The groups are all different, so some of them meet up really regularly and hold events and run inquiries, and some of them work on a bit more of an informal basis. But you can have a look at the full list of groups on the Parliament website, and you might find one or two that are of relevance to your research area. So the ways to use these uh, little parts of Parliament I've just given you a skim over. The Commons Library, the Lords Library, Post and all party parliamentary groups. These are the things practically that I suggest you could do. You've got your well written briefing, send it in to the Commons Library or the Lords Library. You can contact them on papers at parliament.uk or send it into post and it will be given to the relevant subject specialist in either the libraries or post and send that briefing in with an offer to contribute as they need. That means that the staff working in those research and information teams at Parliament are aware of your work. They've seen that you can write well. They may well get in touch with you or they might just use your briefing and they will cite you if they've used that briefing. You could also identify an APPG or maybe an MP or Lord who's a member of an APPG so you know they're interested in a particular topic and send them your well written briefing uh, and offer to support any work they're doing in that area. And that just means that you are targeting your research towards a group of members, a group of MPs or Lords who are potentially interested in that particular topic area. Don't send in a paper with no context at all. Don't send a briefing to all MPs and all members of the House of Lords. It's a real waste of your time and everyone's energy. Don't send a paper to a select committee unless you've written it to submit as written evidence in response to an inquiry. And remember, we've got a whole session about select committees if you want to explore that a bit further. OK, so that's some top tips about sending your research into Parliament. What I'm going to do is just go back over to Laura and see if there are any more questions that myself or Christiana can answer. 
so we'll start off uh, with a question to you, Naomi, if that's all right. So we, um, we've mentioned today in the session uh, to make sure that the information that we're writing about is of interest to policymakers. Could you say a little bit more about what, um, well, how researchers can find out what policymakers and people at Parliament are interested in? Is there anywhere that people can go to find out more about that? So lots of ways to find out what Parliament's interested in at the moment. And actually, we've got a whole page on our web hub for researchers, which is just what is Parliament interested in. Uh, some top tips, though, have a look at what is going on in the House of Commons and House of Lords chambers at the moment. So what debates are scheduled at the moment? What laws are being passed at the moment? You can easily find that information on the front page of the Parliament website. There's a calendar um, and a section called what's on. So it's a pretty good bet that if there is a debate scheduled at Parliament on a topic or if there is a, a law going through on a particular subject, there will be a lot of people at Parliament interested in that at the moment. You can also have a look at what research briefings are being published. So you can search all the research briefings that are published from Parliament, whether they've come from the House of Commons Library, the House of Lords Library or post. Um, so you can have a look at what topics are being covered. If the Commons and Lords Libraries are publishing briefings on a particular topic, that means there are people at Parliament who want to know about that topic. And the final thing, the final tip I'd give you is um, have a look at what parliamentary questions are being asked. So MPs and Lords can submit written questions to the government. There will be loads on many, many different topics. You can just have a scan through them, see if there are any of relevance to your research area. And the good thing about that is that you can also see who's asked that question. And then you'll know that exact MP or the exact member of the House of Lords is potentially interested in your research and you can contact them directly. So Christiana um, got a question around if there's a specific referencing style that is expected of people writing for Parliament and um, I think in particular uh, kind of what referencing style you use might be interesting to hear and um, and how you find using that. Uh, thanks Laura and um, this is a almost a tricky question if you want because as I mentioned before we have different reference uh, we have different products now not only post not and post brief but also uh, rapid responses and we use totally different ways to deal with references. In uh, uh, rapid responses we use links but in uh, post brief and post no and uh, I would say keep it like you know the classic almost academic reference one with like you know all the authors the DOI and also put the hyperlink to the to the specific paper in a classic references style you know that you would use. So use hyperlinks but only in the reference list. Uh, not in the main text because I think it's getting gets a bit confusing. We've thrown loads of information at you. We've taken you through um, the difference between Parliament and government. We've taken you through loads of information about how to write a good briefing for a parliamentary audience. And I've thrown some information at you as well about what you do with that briefing once you've written it. So I'm aware that is a lot. I just wanted to leave you with a reassurance that although we've thrown a lot of information at you, there is plenty of support available for you to work with Parliament. We have a lot of online resources and how to guides on our web hub for researchers. That's parliament.uk forward slash research hyphen impact. If you're on Twitter, follow us on at UKPAL underscore research. We share on there any opportunity we find for you to work with Parliament as well as any advice and information we think will be useful for you as a researcher. And you've got a dedicated knowledge exchange unit to help you. That's myself, it's Laura who you've met asking the questions and it's our colleague Sarah as well. And you can reach us on keu at parliament.uk, keu knowledge exchange unit at parliament.uk. But behind that email address are some friendly faces of myself and Laura and Sarah. I hope you found the session useful and good luck with writing for Parliament. <laughs>